Now here's an interesting topic. How do we manage working landscapes? It's a presentation for the Rangeland Principals class at the University of Idaho. I'm Karen Launchbaugh. I'm a professor of rangeland ecology. And today I want to outline just some of the major uh, trends that I see in frameworks for managing landscapes. So I'm going to divide those major approaches to planning and management uh, on rangelands into kind of three categories. We're going to start with managing across land ownerships. That's indeed a challenge. A couple of approaches that you may have heard of are called would be called all lands, all hands, or collaborative resource management. I'm going to talk about the challenge of managing multiple uses. We know that the values and uses of land vary across the landscape, and also they vary from a uh, time of year to another time of year. So we'll talk about some approaches that take into account those two variances related to multiple use. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about managing for outcomes. Outcome-based land management is kind of all the rage right now. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we consider ecological, economic, and social outcomes, and how we try to avoid prescriptions. So I'm going to talk about those different emphases or different approaches to land management, but they all have similar, some common elements. There's just sort of one sort of flow of activities that happen, whether you're talking about uh, collaborative resource management, individual management planning. Uh, however it's done, there's basically four things that have to happen. One, uh, someone has to set a goal, e either the individual who owns the land or a group of people who are managing and influencing that land. Second, you have to create a plan. You have to decide what to do to meet your goal. Third, you have to monitor to see if you're getting there. So you monitor outcomes. And then finally, you have to adjust and um, replan or evaluate how well you're doing and make some adjustments. This diagram is one that um, is a little complicated, but it shows how those adjustments can happen on a lot of different ways. This is uh, basic elements of adaptive management. Remember that one of the greatest challenges in land management is when you have to manage across land ownerships. We know that natural processes occur across land ownerships. Fire doesn't stop at the boundary between a BLM and a private land. A wildlife don't stop. They don't know what type, who owns the land that they're living on. Water doesn't stop. Weeds move across equally, uh, no matter who owns the land, etc., etc. So we know that natural process processes pay no attention to land ownerships. So the idea of all lands approaches that is that management should also work across land ownerships. A couple of ways that we can manage across land ownerships uh, would be if we bring people together to manage a resource that's important. Um, so when people come together to manage a resource or a, a, a value that they have, th those would be groups like cooperative weed management areas where um, land ownership uh, people who own land in a whole watershed or in a whole area might come together because, again, weeds aren't going to stop at the borderline. Uh, sage grouse working groups is another example. Uh, rangeland fire protection associations. Uh, also, there's a really cool example of the, a group that tried to that came together in the Big Hole region and in, in parts near Dillon, Montana, to um, develop a conservation agreement, a uh, CCAA candidate conservation agreement with assurances for the Arctic grayling, and they were quite successful. So that, that was a group that, that um, rallied around one species. So all, all of these are ways that we see people coming together to manage resources. Uh, they have some differences, but they all do focus on a common goal. And the other real advantage of these kind of collaboratives is that they bring a diversity of skills and resources together. So you may not have a lot of time, but maybe you have a lot of money, or, or maybe you have a lot of expertise, or maybe you own a four-wheeler, or, or maybe you have a friend who knows a lot about a species. So by bringing all those skills together, you can really bring it, uh, make a team that can address challenges. These are all elements of what we would call collaborative resource management. One of the approaches that addresses challenges of land management is, is facing the issue of multiple uses. So we know that rangelands have a variety of values, multiple values on any one piece of land, and the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act of 1976 said that federal land managers would manage with these various uses in mind. So the actual definition of uh, multiple use in that act was that the land managers would manage various resources and values in combinations that best meet the needs of present and future generations that use that land. So it had those three elements. Use a variety of resources in combinations to meet present and future needs of society. 
in in the in FLIPMA or the Federal, Federal Land Policy and Management Act, uh, the agencies must consider interactions among these uses. And in order to balance those uses and protect those values, they generally apply restrictions or enhancements. So in other words, they might apply, let's say, a, a road restriction. You cannot go down this road because there might be a, a, a fire hazard or, or an invasive species, or there might be a wildlife species of concern. On the other hand, they might imply enhancements. They might um, improve the camping in an area to, uh, to improve the use of that area for recreation. Uh, they also, the FLIPMA also requires that public lands include public or cooperators in, uh, when they make decisions. So this is applied mostly to federal lands. The act is applied to federal lands, but I, I see in most of my work that private landowners also um, manage lands with multiple use in mind. And they do this for a number of reasons, um, largely just to make their operations sustainable. So whether they're trying to use all the resources they have so they can make more economic stability or whether it's a matter of the social um, values of their family or the community they often look at their land and they really try to combine the many values so i think multiple use is mandated on federal lands uh, but it's also applied on private lands just because it makes sense so multiple uses an interesting thought um, that comes up a lot when you read about multiple uses is you don't have to do everything at every place in other words not every use on every acre some parts of the landscape are better for some things and and other parts are better for other things so uh, th that they are often restrictions or the idea that we could use some lands for some uses and others for others not every use on every acre also, you don't need to, to do everything at the same time of year. The value of land for specific uses changes throughout the year. So in these diagrams, we have sort of roads that are open during one season, but closed during another. This, uh, the middle picture is one I took in um, Arizona, and I think it's just kind of interesting that they're looking at travel management and they're really warning uh, bicyclers to take caution. A really successful program in Idaho is the Care Share program. It's where the, the um, Idaho Rangeland Resources Commission has partnered with BLM and the Forest Service to really make sure that people who use the land understand the, what livestock are doing out on that land. And if you want to learn more about CareShare, just Google that, Idaho Rangeland Resources Commission, CareShare. And there's some really cool things like videos that show recreationists how to open gates. We wouldn't always think about that, but if you're recreating on rangelands, that's a skill that you may need. The final kind of approach that I'm hearing a lot about today and working on is outcome-based land management. Uh, so outcome-based land management is a change in the focus of what how we're going to think about outcomes. So historically, we might have really thought of ecological outcomes. Don't spend a lot of time thinking about if we put in this bridge or we do this enhancement, how is it going to affect the community, the ecological community? What outcome-based land management is, is try to really make sure that we're also thinking about the economic outcomes not, not just to the community but also to an individual and then finally what are the social outcomes so if we're having grazing on a specific land how is that affecting the community or the family that lives in that area socially so that idea of often called the bo triple bottom line ecological economic and social uh, all needing to be part of making decisions um, is outcome baseline management a lot of what the emphasis on outcome-based management is uh, an effort to avoid prescriptions. And I'll give an example from grazing. When uh, people um, renew their grazing permit, typically what's in that permit is the number of animals you can graze and during what seasons. Well, that doesn't always make sense because so there may be a lot of, of vegetation one year that we need more animals to, um, say, reduce fuel hazard. There might be other years that are very little uh, biomass and we need to reduce the numbers. And there also might be a situation where we had a late spring and it might not make sense to set a prescription for time. And the time might be more important that we just think about how grazing at whatever time of year in whatever conditions is going to influence the ecological, economic and social outcomes. So a lot of outcome based management is trying to avoid prescriptions and being very flexible and very adaptive. Uh, other cool things about outcome-based land management that it tends to be collaborative across landscapes. A good colleague of mine, 
who is with the Nature Conservancy, Lou Lente, often says that we need to do management at scales that matter. And what Lou means by that is, is, is we need to think big. If we want to have a hard, a large conservation outcome, then we need to collaborate across large scales, and that means landscapes. Um, sustainable working landscapes that provide a diversity of goods are needed for those who work on rangelands, live on rangelands, and recreate on rangelands. So another implicit part of outcome baseline management is not just those three ecological, economic, and social goals, but also the variety of people that use those lands. So those are just a few kind of pillars of, of resource management that are going to come into play in the next section of this class when we start to try to figure out how to do this right.